he doesn't need any introduction. He was with us from the start of this church in March of 98 in our home at a, as our 11-year-old praise and worship leader. And God has used him mightily. And our son, Javan, is getting ready to minister today on Easter of 2021. And we are so proud of you, Javan, and we love you so much. Praise Jesus. Jessica's piano playing was so anointed. She was just in the zone that I was sitting there listening and I was just overcome. I don't even know why I play that thing when she's up here. It just sounds so <laughs> good. It sounded so good. So anyway, I appreciate that, Stephen. Let me, I appreciate that. Let me give a few shout outs before we get started. And first, I got my wife sitting on the front row and I just... I am so beyond blessed that right before I was supposed to come up here, she said, I left my uh, tablet, my notepad back there. And I said, what do you need it for? She said, I want to take notes. I don't know why this lady takes notes when I teach, when she's heard what I'm going to teach already, and she's seen me at my absolute worst. <laughs> Trust me. There is, a, there is a side of me that you cannot begin to imagine. And she has seen it at the worst, and yet she still receives when I minister, and that means so much to me. I am super blessed, and that's just a sign of God's grace in my life. So thank you, Jesus, for that. And also, I want to give a shout out. I hear we got a birthday in the room, Mr. Cohen. I want to embarrass you as much as I possibly can. So stand up, Cohen, and let everyone look at you, and I hope you blush and get embarrassed. And <laughs> You have to. We're not progressing with the service until you... Cohen is going to kill me for that. <laughs> and I also want to give a shout out to a really dear friend of ours, uh, Jonathan Jardon, who's here on the front row. Si te puedes poner el pie, por favor. And this guy right here, I voy a hablar de ti en inglés, espero que entiendas o que Dora te traduzca o algo así, te puedes sentar. But this guy, sorry, that was tongues. <laughs> And we're just in that spirit place that we understand each other. John, this guy went to be with Master Ray. Now, he attends my in-law's church in Guadalajara. And you may have met my brother-in-law, who's going to be in town, Dora's brother. Well, he's supposed to be coming as well. And so my brother-in-law and my father-in-law were the ones who designed uh, Masere's building in Sierra Leone for ECMOI. And so Jonathan... Uh, works with them, and so my brother-in-law had gone to Sierra Leone to be with Mazare, and then uh, Jonathan went to be with Mazare, and then COVID happened, and the world quit turning, and he stayed there for five months, and just had the best attitude, and just served, and loved, and gave 100%, more than 100%, and we've seen this guy and his family uh, in Guadalajara, just serving in my in-laws' church. I mean, they just serve nonstop. They're there when the doors open. They're there when the doors shut. They're always serving. Uh, we went together to uh, a ministry, a mission in uh, the state of Hidalgo in Mexico, and all of us went together. And I just watched this guy serving nonstop. And so this is the kind of people in ministry that inspire me. So it's an honor to have Jonathan with us today. I'm so glad you're here. Bienvenido. <laughs> And the final shout I, I want to give is to the risen King, our Lord and Savior. Can y'all stand up? And this is what today is all about, that He is alive. And because He's alive, we're alive. We died in Him, and we rose to life in Him. And the power of the resurrection will never be lost on us. So give Jesus praise. Give Jesus the glory due his name. Yeshua, we honor you. And we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the life that we have in you. Because you live, we live. Our past was wiped away on that cross. There are no more generational curses. Because we died to what we once were. We are a new creation, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, 
And it all began at that cross where he did not have to give his life. He was not obligated. You heard me teach before in that dynamic between Boaz and Ruth, where Ruth had no legal claim on Boaz being a, a Moabite. Boaz was not even the closest relative. And yet, out of his love for her, he voluntarily subjected himself to a law that he had no obligation to keep. That law that would redeem the bride that he loved. Now, he got to redeem the land and everything that came along in that whole package, but what he wanted was the bride. And so he, Boaz voluntarily took himself to present himself at, to the elders at the gate and voluntarily subjected himself to a law that he had no legal obligation to keep. But he made a binding uh, decision. He bound himself to keep that law because of his love for the one that would be his bride. And that is what our Messiah did for us. That we had no legal claim on him and there was no obligation for him to redeem us but because of his love for you. That when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, so that no accusation against you could ever stand, so that no enemy could ever come up and find a loophole and say, no, this is not just, this redemption is not just. No, the law and the demands of the law have forever been settled, and he has wiped out that handwriting of requirements that was contrary to you and has made peace through the blood of his cross and you stand redeemed and you stand holy and without blame before him in love let us give praise to our risen king Father, we praise you. Father, I believe that this resurrection day is a divine appointment, that you have us here for such a time as this in the right place at the right time. I thank you for the reality of the resurrection, that we are alive because of that resurrection. And today, I thank you that the word is alive, and as the word is sown into our hearts this morning that as the message goes forth, we don't receive it as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God which works effectively in those who believe. And we thank you, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher, that the heart of the Father is expressed, that the person of Jesus is revealed, and that the sound that people hear today will not be the sound of my voice, but the still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking and quickening truths that I have not even uttered. And that still small voice will drown out the voice of guilt. It will drown out the voice of condemnation. It will drown out the voice of shame and fear and anxiety and worry and unworthiness and any other voice that would try to speak to my brothers and sisters in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. I am going to try. All I said is I'm going to try, and I hear laughter. What is the deal? Stop judging me, guys. I'm going to try. It shouldn't be that funny. <laughs> I'm going to try to make the most of my time. I've already failed with my 30 seconds that I've already taken, uh, stammering here. But I, I'm going to try... To, to take advantage of this time that we have today. And I've got, as always, I've got more to say than time to share it. However, we've got six weeks to work with. Some of you may be happy about that. Some of you may not be happy about that. But we're going to be, this is a six-week study that we're doing. And we're starting today on Resurrection Sunday. And so I'm going to invite you to join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And even though today is Resurrection Sunday, I'm going to give more emphasis to the cross, to the sacrifice. And I'm going to do it in light of the Passover that Jesus fulfilled. And so we're going to do a six-week study unpacking what the Passover is 
and looking throughout Scripture from the Exodus to the cross. Every time we see the Passover observed in Scripture, anytime there's record of the Passover being observed, we're going to unpack it and we're going to see glimpses of our redemption as it's revealed throughout Scripture. So again, this is going to be a six-week study, but the Passover is more than just a day. It is more than just the Feast of Israel. It is the person of Christ. This is what's written in Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll actually go to verse, well, we can start in verse 7, actually, and this will be fine. It says in verse 7, therefore, if we can get it here, thank you so much, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. I will be talking about the leaven. Let me just say very quickly, you'll hear a lot of things, some things that I won't be covering today, talking a lot about the leaven, talking about the lamb, okay? I will not address all of it today, but we've got six weeks to work with, all right? So it's a long series, but we're going to draw out truths of these parallels of how they point to Christ, how Christ fulfilled it. But look what the scripture says in verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Can you say Christ our Passover? Say it again, Christ our, Passover. Christ our Passover. So notice, this verse makes it clear that the Passover is not just a day that we observe. It's not just a day of the Feast of Israel, but it is the person of Christ and what he accomplished and what he fulfilled in his vicarious suffering. Now, if you only look at the scripture and you only see the letter but not the spirit, you might just observe a day. And the Apostle Paul talked about those who just observe days, they observe feasts, but the meaning of it is completely lost on them. And they're just keeping a tradition. It's just the traditions of men, as it were, and it makes the word of God of no effect, but they are locked into tradition, but they're missing the meaning and the heart of what it represents. So there is no value in just keeping it for the sake of the ritual whatsoever. Those who just keep it for the sake of the ritual, but the meaning is lost in them, they're really not accomplishing anything. The Apostle Paul has a lot to say about that. But when you understand not the letter, but the spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, one of my passions are types and shadows of Christ in the Old Testament. See, I believe that the, Old, the, the New Testament, the redemption of the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. And the truths of the Old Testament the hidden truths of the Old Testament are revealed in the New Testament, okay? And it all revolves around Christ. So if you're not just seeing letter, but you're seeing spirit, you're going to see Jesus, okay? And so I, I have a passion for the types and shadows, the pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. But let me just say that if you get caught up in pictures, if you get caught up in rituals, if you get caught up in tradition, but you're missing the substance then you're completely missing the point. Now, shadows are meant to point to the substance, right? And so I like to give this illustration. Uh, there's a couple of illustrations I like to make this point. That one of them is, if you've ever flown, uh, right before your plane lands, you'll see a shadow on the ground. The plane will cast a shadow oftentimes, and you can look and see it over the trees right before you land. Well, that shadow points to the airplane that casts the shadow. But if you try to jump on the shadow and ride it somewhere, it's not going to work. You can't ride a shadow. It's meant to point you to the airplane, right? You can't ride a shadow. You can't embrace a shadow. And there's a lot of pictures that God has given us in the Old Testament. We have to use them for what they are. And I'll, I'll address this in week three of this series more thoroughly. But I like to illustrate it this way that my wife, when she went to Kenya, this was back in 2012, she was in Bible college and she took a trip to Kisumu, Kenya. And she gave me a picture of herself, a picture of us, actually. And on this picture, she wrote a love note to me. She actually left it for me on our bed. And so I didn't know it was there. I took her to the airport, and I came back, and I was facing two weeks without her, and I'm completely lost without her. I don't know what to do. I don't know which way is up. It's a mess. I'm, I'm an absolute 
basket case when she's not around. And so I came back to our apartment where we were living at the time and I found this picture that she'd left of me and I had my emotional moment. We call it a moment. You might call it a meltdown. But I picked it up and I <laughs> saw the picture and I turned it around. I read the love note that she wrote me and so I held on to that picture and I, I carried it with me while she was gone and I would look at the picture and I'd read the love note and she gave that to me to bless me, to, to make me think of her. I didn't need it to think of her, but it certainly helped keep her present in my heart and mind at all times. And so then when she got back in town, I want you to imagine if when my wife got back in town, what, how would she have responded to me if I had completely ignored her all together, and just held the picture and looked at the picture. And she's trying to talk to me, and I, I, I'm too engaged with this picture. And I'm kissing the picture, and I'm hugging the picture, and I'm dancing with the picture, <laughs> whatever, okay? But I'm ignoring her. Is that going to bless her? Of course not. Who gave me the picture? She did. But if I use that picture and I hold the picture but I ignore her, She's going to resent the very thing that she gave to me to point me to her because I'm misusing it. I'm ignoring her and I'm just holding a picture. And that sometimes is what we have a tendency to do when people find these beautiful types and shadows in the Old Testament pointing us to Christ. Sometimes people want to embrace the shadow and they forget the substance. And so I've seen that happen with people that engage in the traditions and the rituals of the Feast of Israel that God himself instituted, but they forget that it points to the Messiah. And I've seen that happen all too often. And the Lord actually says in Isaiah 1, and we'll get to this in week three of the series, but the Lord says, your feasts and your sacrifices, they, they, they're an abomination to me. Because he said, I, I've, I've got your, your, your traditions and I, I, you're, you're doing all the right things, but I don't have your heart. I don't have your heart. And so... I am not teaching, when I talk about the Passover, you hear me teach on this, we're not just talking about the rituals. Now, Dora and I do have a Seder plate at home, and we set it up at Passover. We put the lamb shank and the, the charoset and the karpas and everything. It's all there. But it's not just rituals for the sake of rituals. Every bit of it is to point us to Christ. My wife led us in the Passover Seder last year, 2020, when all of us had to be in quarantine. It was really remarkable because I saw an awareness of the Passover among the body of Christ that I had really never seen before. In fact, not only were we in quarantine here in the States, of course, my wife and I were supposed to have been in the Philippines. We were going to be there for a full month, and we had to cancel our trip for obvious reasons. But the entire world shut down. Everybody was in quarantine, and it was the first time that the people of Israel all had to stay in their homes on the night of the Passover since the very first Passover in the book of Exodus chapter 12. And so I believe last year was significant. There was an awareness in the body of Christ and the Lord downloaded into the body of Christ a lot of revelation about what the Passover actually represents, not just the rituals of the Passover. And so in that season last year, it was April the 8th, 2020, and my wife led us in the Seder ceremony. And she, it was a unique day for us personally because April the 8th is the anniversary of when I asked her to be my girlfriend back in 2004. So we were celebrating that anniversary as well as Passover. So we decided to make it a night of holy romance, a night of the threefold cord, celebrating the head, Christ the Messiah, and the two of us and the union that's been formed and so we recognize both our becoming uh, boyfriend and girlfriend and, and, and being, in a sense, betrothed, and our, our relationship with Christ. That threefold cord is what we celebrate at that. And so she led us in a, in a Passover Seder. And if you think I talk a lot, she was so fired up that night. We had a four-hour Passover ceremony. She would talk about all the elements on the Seder plate, how they point to Christ. Then she'd cry. And then she'd talk about the next one. She'd cry some more. And I was blessed. And we had a good time. That's the way it's supposed to look because everything is pointing to Jesus. And so this is what I want to address over these six weeks and you might say, well, I thought that New Testament believers didn't have to keep the Passover. Well, it's not something that you have to keep. But there is a richness in recognizing the feasts that God ordained, 
not what man-made tradition has done to them, but the feast that God ordained and how they were intended to point us to the Messiah. And here's my rule of thumb. If it mattered to Jesus, it should matter to me. And Jesus kept the Passover every year of his life on the earth, and it was very, very significant to Jesus because he himself was the Passover. This is what 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says that we just read a moment ago. It says, for Christ our Passover, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So we have to have this understanding and this mentality that we're not talking about uh, Passover in the sense of just a day, a ritual, a feast, a tradition. We're talking about what Jesus did for us in his vicarious suffering, in his redemptive work. And so we found it appropriate to start this series right now, today, on Resurrection Sunday. If you follow us on Tuesday nights in our Aletheia Bible study, I've been going through this series, and we're simultaneously going through the same study on Tuesday nights. I'm three weeks ahead of myself on Tuesdays, and it's, we've never really done this to where I'm teaching the same series in both Sundays and Tuesdays, but we wanted it to be this time of the year because Passover uh, just occurred in today's Resurrection Sunday, and so this is the perfect time for us to do this study. So I want to invite you to go on this journey with me, and we're going to go from the Exodus to the cross, and we're going to look at every single time that we have record of the Passover being observed. Let me just say that there are obviously times that Israel kept the Passover, such as in the days of King David, the days of Solomon, where there's no scriptural record of those Passovers. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at every, and I mean every, single record of when the Passover was held in scripture, starting from that first night in Egypt, in Exodus 12, and going all the way to Leviticus 22, where Jesus sat with his disciples at the Last Supper and held the Passover with them. When we do this, you're going to see things that point to Christ all throughout the Scripture. So, for example, uh, and I'll just give you a little bit of a, a, a preview right now of what's coming in this series. But when we look at the Passover that the children of Israel kept in the wilderness, all right, we're going to address that, and then we're going to talk about uh, the Passover they kept when they crossed the Jordan River. Crossing the Jordan River, one of the first things they did was keep the Passover. We're going to talk about how the lamb does not just take us out. The lamb was meant to take us in, right? And so we'll be covering that. And then we're going to uh, fast forward to the days of Hezekiah, and we're going to see the Passover that Hezekiah kept when he was king. And what we're going to draw from his Passover is that the Passover, it's more than just getting all the rituals right. In the days of Hezekiah, they got most of the rituals wrong. And yet God had their heart and God was more interested in their heart than in the perfection of their rituals. So you'll see that for Hezekiah. Then we'll fast forward to the days of Josiah. And we're going to see when Josiah kept the Passover. And when we look at his Passover, we're going to see how the king is the one that provided the lambs for the people. In the days of Josiah, the, the lambs came from the king's possession. Well, what's the parallel there? The Lord himself provided the lamb, okay? So we're gonna draw from that, and then we'll fast forward to the days after the return of the captives. There was 70 years of captivity uh, in Babylon, and they returned from captivity in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, and then they held a Passover, and we're gonna see the reality of redemption, and the theme for that Passover will be that redemption always leaves you better off than you had been before the fall ever occurred. Okay? And then that'll take us all the way to the day of Christ when he brought it full circle and he himself fulfilled it. Okay? So that's what we're going to cover over a period of six weeks. I'm just giving you a little bit of preview of what's to come. Today, I'm going to try to lay some groundwork, and I don't want to delve too deeply uh, into what we're covering just because I want to get, give you opportunities to go and have celebrations with your family today. So I'm trying to be cognizant of the time. But here's what I want to do. I want to look at how significant and important this feast of the Passover was to Jesus. And so if you'll join me, let's look very quickly at a couple of scriptures in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. In Luke 2, verse 41, we're going to see here that every year, Mary and Joseph actually took Jesus to Jerusalem. They didn't just... Uh, keep the Passover 
and Nazareth, they went to Jerusalem every year at the Passover, and they kept it as a family. So this is Luke 2.41. It says his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. This is talking about Jesus, that his parents would take him every single year. Now we fast forward in Jesus' life, okay, to when he's already grown and he's begun his ministry. So you see that every year growing up, he would go with Mary and Joseph to Jerusalem for the Passover. And then we get to John chapter 2. And in John chapter 2, we see Jesus in Jerusalem again at the Passover. And I believe it's verse 13, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 13. It says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now if we can go to verse 23, you'll see that Jesus, this was his custom to go to the city of the king, to Jerusalem, every year at Passover. Well, he was getting ready because on the final year of his ministry here on the earth, he needed to be in Jerusalem for what was going to take place on the night of the Passover. And so here, uh, this is John chapter 2, verse 23. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. So this shows us that his ministry has already begun. In fact, this is around the time of the first account of the cleansing of the temple. And so we see Jesus in Jerusalem performing signs and wonders during the Passover. So the point I'm trying to make is that Jesus kept this feast. However, he did not just keep it for the sake of the ritual, but what it represented, how it pointed to him. And so now, having laid that groundwork, I want to take you to that night, that night of his arrest, where he's sitting with his disciples at the Last Supper in Leviticus. I'm sorry, Leviticus. <laughs> Got you. Trying to make sure you're awake. In Luke <laughs> chapter 22. All right? Luke chapter 22. So let's go to Luke 22, all right, and we'll go to verse 14, and this gives us a window. Again, everything that we're covering in this series, anytime the scripture gives us a window into when the Passover was observed. So this is Luke 22 and verse 14, and when the hour had come, he sat down, and his 12 apostles with him, and then he said to them, now watch carefully what he says, with fervent desire... Now, I want you to hear the intensity of his words here. With fervent desire. With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, let me talk a little bit about this Greek word that he's using for desire. It actually appears twice in this same verse. Notice he says uh, it appears in verb form and in noun form. So first in noun form, he says, with fervent desire, noun form, I have desired, verb form, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I've desired with fervent desire. So anytime you use the same word, it's for emphasis. So he's using the same word, verb form, noun form. But this word, its connotation, it's very interesting. Because the connotation of this word for desire, more often than not, actually is a negative connotation. Now, of course, the way Jesus is using it is not in the negative sense. When I say negative connotation, this is usually a word that implies some type of lust or concupiscence, okay? But it's a, a deep longing, all right? It's a deep longing, a, a yearning. But he says it, and of course, in a very godly manner, and he says, I have longed for and yearned to share this Passover with you before I suffer. So here's where I draw on the basis of this particular verse that the Passover was very significant to Jesus. And this is why I take issue with New Testament believers who act like, well, the Passover really isn't something that we have to observe. You're right. It's not something that we have to observe. And if you're doing it just for the sake of the ritual, you're completely missing the point. However, my way of thinking is that if it was significant to Jesus, it needs to be significant to me. If it mattered to him, it should matter to me. And so we see how deeply he valued this time of recognizing the Passover, okay, with fervent desire. Now, he says, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He was very literally on his way after that moment to go fulfill the Passover. 
He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Passover was more than just about looking back. And this is what you need to understand. The Passover is not just a looking back. Now, a lot of people get the idea that because the, the, the people of Israel, they get together as family and friends and they observe the Passover and they look back to the days of the Exodus when God delivered the people of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. It's a looking back. Yes, they looked back, but the Passover is more than just looking back. Every Passover that you see in Scripture from the very first night in Exodus 12 always involves looking ahead. And when Moses dealt with the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 12, that was a night of looking ahead. Moses said, when you come into the land, God has promised you and and, and given you. You will keep this ordinance year after year in all your generations. And so that night, they were looking ahead. The Passover is not just about looking back. Looking back is just a small component. This is about looking ahead. And you'll hear that even Jesus, when he was leading this Passover with his disciples, he was looking ahead. Notice his wording. So he says in verse 15, and he said, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And then verse 16 goes on to say, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, he was on his way to fulfill it that very night, but he's looking ahead to the kingdom. You hear what I'm saying? He's looking ahead. Now, people that just keep the Passover for the sake of ritual, for the sake of tradition, it's just a looking back. But Jesus was looking ahead. And in fact, it's honestly, even the Orthodox Jews, when they keep the Passover, there's still a component where at the end of the Seder ceremony, they'll say, next year in Jerusalem. They're still looking ahead. But this Passover, is it, it, when Jesus kept it with his disciples, he was looking all the way to the days when we would be together in the kingdom. And this is why this is significant. Because the Passover, and don't miss this, this is a major point, a major component in this series that the Passover serves for us as a reminder that after a period of dark, tangible, real sorrow, there always comes joy unspeakable and full of glory. That there is always profound joy that follows sorrow and suffering. So the Passover acknowledges the suffering, but the Passover, more importantly, looks ahead to the glories that follow. The profound joy that, yeah, sorrow may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And it's even built into the customs of keeping the Passover. And there were some things that the way that the, the, the Seder is conducted today that were added by the rabbis over time, but it's meant to keep uh, the the, the the integrity of what the Passover was meant to represent. When you keep the Seder plate, they'll take the, what's called the karpas, they'll dip them into the salt water. The salt water represents the tears from the suffering of the slavery. And then they'll take uh, what's called bitter herbs, okay? And a lot of times the bitter herbs for the people will be horseradish. I happen to love horseradish. I don't know if anybody's with me. I really do. We kept uh, Passover together, Dora and I, we, this was 2000, I think 19, and we got with a small group from Emory University, Ari sitting back here, and she had just gotten saved not long before. And she was, uh, she's, she's Jewish, and so she had grown up celebrating Passover, and this was going to be her first Passover as a believer in the Messiah. And so she was here in Atlanta and didn't have family here, and so she had a, a couple, Michelle, who introduced us to her, was there at Emory, and then another friend of ours, Jonathan. And so Dora and I said, why don't we just have a small get-together of the, of the three of you guys from Emory, just come over? And so we did, and, and anyway, Dora and I love horseradish, and so we kept going after the bitter herbs that night. We just kept it, and Jonathan was the same way, and bitter herbs are supposed to be bitter. They're supposed to be, the, 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 you're not supposed to enjoy them. I enjoy them, and so <laughs> I don't know what Ari was thinking. Maybe she's thinking, man, Gentile believers are so weird. That's, they've completely, they don't get it. That's not how it's supposed to work. But man, we were attacking the bitter herbs. I was putting on my chicken. I was putting on everything. But what will happen in the Seder ceremony is that the, you, you eat the bitter herbs, right? And then following the bitter herbs, it's the, the bitterness of the suffering. But then there's something sweet that follows. That's called charoset. And it's very sweet. 
And it reminds you that there's a sweetness of joy that's on the way behind the bitterness of the sorrow that causes you to forget the bitterness of the suffering. And see, that's what the reality was for the people of Israel in days of Egypt. But that's why God wanted them to continue keeping the Passover throughout their generations. Because even Jesus, when he sat with his disciples on that night that we have here in Luke 22 that we just read, that Jesus said, with fervent desire, I have desired to keep this Passover with you before I suffer. And that suffering for him would be, in a sense, the bitter herbs. And yet, none of us could ever come close to fathoming or comprehending even a fraction of a percent of what Jesus suffered. You could take all of your suffering of your entire lifetime, all of your mental anguish, all of your physical pain and ailment, and everything that you've ever been through in your life, and we could combine it for all of us in this room. And if we did, we would not come close to anywhere near approaching what Jesus suffered on that night. And yet, the suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory. And that's what Romans chapter 8, verse 18 teaches us, that Paul said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And this is what the Passover reminds us of. As I said, even on the plate, even when they take the bitter herbs followed by the charoset, that there's a sweetness that follows the bitterness. And that sweetness causes you to forget the sorrow. And the Lord is saying that there is a joy and that joy shall not be taken from you and it will cause you to forget. And Revelation says, they shall cry no more that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and the bitterness of your sorrow will be forgotten. Followed by that sweetness. It's actually made with a, 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 it's made, usually they make it with a, a kosher for Passover, the wine, the sweet red wine. Some people take issue with that, but the point is is that it's like the sweetness of the blood, okay? And so it brings in this sweetness that causes you to forget your sorrow, your suffering. And this is actually, this principle is what enabled Jesus to endure all the suffering at the cross. That's what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 teaches us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. When it says he despised the shame, yes, he suffered public shame and humiliation that we can't begin to fathom, but to him, it was worth it all, and he disesteemed that shame, and, and he was willing to take it. Isaiah chapter 50, I think verse 6 said, I did not uh, turn away from the, the, the spitting. I gave my cheek to those who plucked the beard. And all of it was for the joy that was set before him. And you might say, what could it possibly give such joy that it would make that type of suffering worthwhile? Do you want to know the answer? You. You. Seeing that you would be on the other side of all of that suffering, sharing his inheritance with him for all of eternity. You were the joy set before him. In a sense, you enabled him to endure the cross. Can you imagine thinking that you enabled Jesus to endure the cross? Because he could look through the corridors of time and see you for all eternity with him. And looking at you and seeing you beside him for all eternity made him say, yep, it's worth it. It's worth it. And in a sense, looking at you, because what will happen when they, when they eat the Passover, they'll take the, the, the matzah bread. Even the matzah bread is a beautiful representation. It's unleavened. And you'll see that it's, it's got the, the stripes and it's pierced, okay, the holes. In the same way, it represents what happened to the Messiah. That he, it was by his stripes that were healed and he was pierced, his hands and his feet and his side. And they would take the, they take the matzah bread and they, they put the, the, the bitter herbs, almost making, some people make like a little sandwich, right? A bitter herb sandwich, okay? And then you can add the charoset to know that even in the bitterness, it's not like you just eat the bitter herbs and then get straight to the haroset so you can forget about the bitter herbs. They actually, you can add, after you take the bitter herbs, then add in some haroset. So even in the midst of the sorrow, 
there's joy coming and I'm going to hold on to that joy. Even while I'm tasting the bitterness, God is giving me the sweetness of the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the sorrow so that he's given you a sweet taste even in the midst of the bitterness. That's powerful. And so this is Jesus sitting with his disciples on that night. And so let's go back to Luke 22. Is this blessing you guys? And I'm just going to go and take my time through this because, as I said, we got six weeks. And at the end of six weeks, I'm sure I'll say I didn't have time to say everything I wanted to say. (laughs) But that's just how it is for me. So let's go to Luke 22. (laughs) All right, so he's told them in verse 15... With fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He's looking ahead. Passover always involves looking ahead. And then, verse 17, uh, then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Of course, then verse 19 talks about the bread. Now, we're going to skip down to verse 20. And most people, a lot of uh, Christians think that there was only one cup involved. And actually, when you take Passover, there's actually four cups in the celebrating of the Passover. And I'll, I'll talk about the multiple cups in the final week of this series. You don't want to miss that message. I promise you. When we get to the final week of this series, so I think that's five weeks from now, we're going to be talking about the multiple cups. You don't want to miss it. How Jesus made a cup exchange. Okay. I'm trying to give you a sneak peek without giving it away because I want you guys to be here in five weeks, all right? But Jesus made a cup exchange with us and I'm not gonna tell you all about what it is. I can just tell you that if you'll recall when Jesus was in the garden that night, what did he pray? He said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. He was about to drink of a cup, which Isaiah talks about, it's called the cup of wrath, and I'm in danger of giving this away, but uh, he was about to drink that cup, and none of us will ever fathom what was in that cup or what it was like to drink it. None of us ever will. Jesus even asked the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, those boys were so immature. And Jesus said, are you able to drink from the cup from which I'm about to drink? And bless their hearts, they didn't know what they were talking about. Said, yes! Oh, yes, the master, we are. We're going to drink it. We will drink it. (laughs) And you can just imagine Jesus just shaking his head. Bless their hearts. And he said, you'll drink of the cup. But actually, when he said, you'll drink of the cup, he was about to give them a different cup. And so they, they didn't know. See, thank you, Jesus. We'll never have to drink the cup he drank because by the grace of God, he tasted death for all of us. Then he gave us a cup in exchange. And that cup in exchange, if you ever hear what David wrote in the Psalms, David said, I will take up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. That's the cup that overflows with the benefits of our salvation. And so we'll talk about the cup exchange in the final week of this this series. But there was a cup exchange. And so there's four cups and... There's the two cups before the meal. There's the two cups after the meal. And so Jesus, lest you think I'm making this up, Luke 22, look carefully. uh, Verse 17 says, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Now go down to verse 20. Verse 20 says, Likewise, he also took the cup. You might think, Does Luke not realize he already wrote that? We've already talked about the cup, Luke. (laughs) No, there's another cup, okay? And this is what's known in the, in the ceremony of the Passover. Uh, what, what Jesus took here is the cup of redemption. Uh, it corresponds to things written into the book of Exodus that I'm not going to address today. Again, some things we're going to skirt over, some things we're going to dig deep into. Uh, but this was the cup of redemption. And this is the cup that Jesus said was the new covenant, Okay? the new covenant in his blood. So then we can take this throughout all of history then and we can actually now put in a puzzle piece. We can actually fill in some gaps here. And you go through Israel's history and you realize they've been drinking these four cups of the Passover all throughout their history in the scriptures. And whenever they got to this third cup, the cup that follows the meal, 
That's the cup of redemption. That is what symbolizes the new covenant. It's then followed by the fourth cup, known as the cup of praise. Okay? And we're to partake of that cup as well. But Jesus said this, this is the cup of redemption. This is the cup of my blood, the, the new covenant that is made in my blood. And now, with the time that's left today, I'm not going to talk about the lamb. We will talk about the lamb next week. Okay? So you'll hear more about the lamb next week. We'll talk a little bit about the blood. Okay? So now, I'm going to talk about the blood that on the night of the Passover... What happened? They had to take the blood of the lamb, and the blood of the lamb had to be applied on the lentils and on the doorpost. Okay? And this is very important because the Lord said on that night that he was going to kill the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast, right? And so I'm summarizing a few things. Next week, we'll get into it more deeply. Today, I just want to give some introduction. Is that okay? All right. So he says, uh, I'm going to killed the firstborn of, of Egypt, both man and beast. And so the angel of death was going to come through. And if the blood had been applied to the doorpost, the lentils, and then the, the, the doorpost and the, the frame, then the angel of death would pass over. Now, here's what I want to convey to you, and this is really essential to understand, okay? The key was not whether the door was open or shut. It was whether the blood had been applied. Now, why is that significant? You'll hear people a lot of times, and they'll say, oh, have you left a door open to the devil? Have you left a door open to the devil? Search. And man, I mean the devil, you think he's like a cockroach. He can just get in little holes. How did he get in here? I had every door shut. Have you left a door open? So, obviously, you don't want to leave doors open to the devil. Can I just tell you? I mean, obviously, it's stupid to leave your door open to the devil. But just because you've made it easy for him to get in doesn't mean he has a legal right to enter and steal from you. Okay? You shouldn't make it easy for him because he is a thief. And he does come to steal and kill and destroy. And he doesn't play fair. Okay, so don't make it easy for him. But even if you've left a door open and the enemy has come in and stolen things from you, he has no legal right to do so. And you can take your authority and command him to go and repay everything that's been stolen instead of just saying, well, I left the door open. Let me tell you, if, if my wife and I, at times when we've gone out of the country to go minister, right, we'll go to Uganda, Kenya for a month. We'll go to the Philippines for a month. And I want you to imagine if we left the country. And not only did I not arm our security system, not only did I not shut the door, or excuse me, lock the door, I have left the door wide open. Notice I said I, because she would never do something that stupid and foolish. But it is very possible that I might do something like that. Okay? I, I have a supernatural ability to forget things. Dora packs... <laughs> For me, And the reason she does is not because of my laziness. It is because of my incompetence in certain areas of my life. I, 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 will, I shouldn't even take time to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. We, she went to Mexico one time, 2017, and I was going to go later and meet her there. And so she said, all right, I've left everything for you. I made it easy for you. You know, like Jesus has made it easy for you, and sometimes we still complicate it. She said, I've left everything there. You can pack your stuff, take your clothes, and everything, it's going to be easy. Just... But I wasn't listening to what she told me. That's where you've got to learn to listen to your wife. And so she left everything. She goes out of the country. And I said, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going in. And so I would go in to pack my stuff, get to Mexico, realize I've got no pants. None. Not a single pair except the one I'm wearing. And I walk in and say, I get up the next day. We're supposed to go like, huh. So I told her, like, I have an issue. We had to go to a market, a marketplace called Tianguis. Tianguis. We had to go out there and to try on. I'm behind a little curtain trying on blue jeans. Super embarrassing. I learned my lesson. So don't complicate things. So I'm the guy that I could potentially leave the house, leave the door wide open. But I want to ask you a question. All right? If I were to leave the country, leave the door wide open, okay? Not even shut it, 
And let's say a thief comes in and just robs us blind, takes everything we got, can't really, the piano's too big, but everything else, he takes it all, leaves. And we get home and every, the place has been ransacked, everything's stolen, okay? Now, if that thief gets caught and I take the thief to court, do you think that the thief will be able to stand before the judge and present the argument? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. His door was open. Do you think that's going to hold water in court if the thief says, well, his door was open? Do you think the judge is going to say, his door was open? That's a game changer. You have every right to go in and steal his stuff because his door was open. You, case dismissed. Of course not. The thief has no right, no legal right to come in and steal even if you left your door open. And so, of course, the, 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 the judge would rule against the thief and then he would probably look at me and use wisdom and look at me and say, hey, next time, shut your door, stupid. <laughs> right? Because that just makes sense. That's wisdom. You want to shut your door. Don't make it easy for the enemy. But just because you've made it easy for the enemy does not give him a legal right to come in and steal from you. And too many of us have let him just take advantage and rob from us and steal from us because we feel guilty. We feel like, I left a door open. I left a window open. I made it easy for him. Yeah, you might have made your mess, but that has not diminished your authority. And so... The reason I say that is because in the Passover, on that night, it wasn't an issue of whether the door was open or shut. It was an issue of had the blood been applied. Has the blood been applied? If the blood's been applied, well, then the angel of death is going to pass right over. It doesn't matter. Listen, if the blood hasn't been applied, a closed door will not keep the angel of death out. It would be like my grandmother, bless her heart, she, we, she, we, she was in assisted living, and she heard that there was a tornado warning in the county. Not a tornado watch, but a tornado warning. It means one's been spotted. And so as soon as she heard there was a tornado warning, she looked at us, and in all seriousness, she said, I better close my curtains. <laughs> I, I respect that grandma, I really do, but... Um, all that's going to do is keep you from seeing it coming. It's not going to do anything else. Okay? Your curtains are not going to stop the tornado. All right? Well, in the same way, closing the door would not have stopped the angel of death from coming in and killing the firstborn. It wasn't going to happen. Are you with me? So if the angel of death is coming in, it doesn't matter if your door's open, shut, windows open, shut. If the blood hasn't been applied, you have no protection. But if the blood has been applied... The enemy has no right. Brothers and sisters, I want you and me, we, we need to learn to live in the reality of the Passover and apply the blood in our lives and say, well, what if I've left a door open here? That, well, then learn to shut it. But that doesn't give the enemy any legal right against you. Right. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, I want us also to look real quick at this idea of the firstborn. And there's so much more. I... It, it, I'm just not going to try. I'm not going to try to address something today that I don't have time to develop. We got six weeks. All right? I'm going to keep reminding myself. I'm not trying to remind you. I'm reminding me. Okay? We got six weeks. It's going to be fun. So I, 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 I want to talk about the firstborn. Because what did I say on that Passover night? That the firstborn of Egypt was killed, both man and beast. Are we in agreement here? Okay? And that's what we give emphasis to when we talk about the Passover story. Nothing wrong with that because that's what the scripture says, right? And so when the people of Israel get together and they have the Seder and they tell the story of the Passover, the Exodus, they talk about the firstborn of Egypt being killed, both man and beast. Absolutely correct, absolutely accurate. But there was something else that happened that night that doesn't get as much attention, but I believe is far more important, also involving a firstborn. And I want you to see it because most people have never paid attention to this. Let's look very quickly at a few scriptures here. Numbers chapter 3, verse 13. And this is an element of the Passover that rarely gets emphasized, but is of supreme significance to us. Okay? I'm talking about us, you and me. So Numbers chapter 3, and in verse 13... God tells us something that took place on that very night of the Passover. We all know that 
the people of Egypt lost their firstborn. But look what God said happened simultaneously. Numbers 3.13, because all the firstborn are mine. On the day, everybody say on the day. day. This is talking about the day of the first Passover. On the day that I struck all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all of the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. And they shall be mine. I am the Lord. So God is saying that simultaneously, while he, while the, the, the firstborn of Egypt were being struck dead, at the very same time, God was actually sanctifying the firstborn on the homes where the blood had been applied. So there was a sanctifying and a consecrating of the firstborn simultaneously in the houses of the people of Israel. Now this is a point that you do not want to miss, okay? Because when we think of that Passover night, it's not really even pleasant to think about. When we think about the final plague, the plagues of Egypt, it's not pleasant to think about all of these Egyptian families waking up and finding that their firstborn son is dead. That's not a pleasant thing to think about. But meanwhile, God was actually consecrating. It wasn't like the the firstborn of the people of Israel were left untouched. They were also touched, but in consecration, being set apart, being sanctified unto the Lord. I'm going to explain why this matters for you. But first, I want you to see it again. God repeats this. Look very quickly at Numbers chapter 8 and look at verse 17. God repeats this. Numbers 8, verse 17, he tells that on that night when he was... Striking dead, the, 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 the firstborn of the people of Egypt. Notice, Numbers eight seventeen. For all the firstborn among the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I struck all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, I sanctified them to myself. In fact, if you keep reading there, I believe into verse 18, God goes on to explain what his intention is. This is actually the beginning right now. This is what I'm reading is the beginning of the the Levitical priesthood. So God was actually taking the Levites, the tribe of the Levites, and he was replacing the firstborn with the Levites. It's it's hard to explain. I I don't want to try to get into a bunch of doctrine, but just hear me. It says, verse 18, I've taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn of the children of Israel. Basically, here's what God did. On the, on the night of the Passover, he sanctified all of the firstborn of Israel to himself. But then in the wilderness, he inexplicably said, now, I'm going to make a swap. And I'm going to put in the Levites in place of the firstborn. So all the firstborn that are mine, I'm going to redeem them with Levites. So the Levites will take their place. And so there were actually more firstborn than there were Levites. So he said, well, there will be a Levite for every firstborn. And the leftover, they'll be redeemed uh, with money that will go into the, the tabernacle. So here's the point. God then replaced the firstborn with Levites. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But first, let me just make this point that God said, on the night, so go back again to verse 17. God said, on the night that I struck the firstborn of Egypt, I sanctified the firstborn of the children of Israel. How have we missed this? This actually did happen in the story of the Exodus, and many of us just overlook it. I want you to see it in Exodus. Let's go to Exodus 13 in verse 1. And the scripture actually tells us that God did this. Exodus 13 verse 1, uh, we'll read into verse 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, in verse 2 he goes on to say, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. So, Here's what's happening. There's there's this dual dynamic. On the night of the Passover, the firstborn of Egypt were being struck dead. The firstborn of the people of Israel were being consecrated. Okay? Now, I want you to see this simultaneous effect. While on one side, the firstborn is being killed, on the other side, the firstborn is being consecrated and redeemed. Okay? Now, we're going to fast forward to when Jesus fulfilled the Passover. And I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, let's go to, I think we can go to verse 12. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 speaks of Jesus, that when Jesus came, he came as the firstborn. Okay? So, actually it's, so verse 12 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. 
Uh, he's delivered us from the, power of the dark, uh, from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood. Everybody say, through His blood. The forgiveness of sins. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. The what? Firstborn. firstborn. See what this says about Jesus? He's the what? Firstborn. The firstborn. So if Jesus is the firstborn, when he came, he came as the firstborn. Okay? So it says, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Why? Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things consist. Now, watch this verse 18, for he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the what? Firstborn from the dead. Notice this, the firstborn from the dead. Well, today happens to be Resurrection Sunday, right? What this tells us, he's the firstborn from the dead. This means he's the firstborn that was slain. The firstborn, so we read from verse 15, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In verse 18, he's the head of the body, the, 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 the church is, uh, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That tells us the firstborn was slain. Jesus, if you take this, this dual, this dichotomy, I guess you could say, of the night of the Passover, there's two sides to this coin. On the night of the Passover, there were the firstborn of Egypt that were slain, and there was the firstborn of Israel that was sanctified and consecrated. So if we look at that coin and we fast forward to when Jesus fulfilled the Passover, Jesus came as a firstborn. Jesus fell into the category of the firstborn slain. It was as though he were not of covenant. It was as though he were of Egypt. And you say, that's blasphemy. No, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So on the night of the Passover, there was a firstborn slain. Well, you, if you look at the Passover, there isn't a firstborn slain without firstborn consecrated and redeemed. God said, on the night, Numbers 3.13, Numbers 8.17, Exodus 13.2, on the night that the firstborn of Egypt was struck, I consecrated the firstborn of Israel. So Jesus came as the firstborn slain. Hebrews 12, 23. Look what Hebrews 12, 23 says. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered, the firstborn who are, not the firstborn who is, the firstborn brothers and sisters who The firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all. Who are these firstborn? The spirits of just men made perfect. But you say, well, I wasn't firstborn. No, but here's what happened. Jesus, by being the true firstborn, choosing to become the firstborn slain, by default, conferred and placed upon you the firstborn blessing. And it's now yours. You, my brothers and sisters, are the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Now, here's what's really powerful about this. Now, I'm going to go back to this little thing I left hanging in the air and didn't explain. And, and this, is, this really digs deep, and I'm almost hesitant to bring this up. But the reason I bring this up, I want you to hear it. So we go back. Uh, I'll just tell you about it. You can study it on your own later. But when I read Numbers 3.13, I read Numbers 8.17, God was making the statement. He said, look, on the night of the Passover, when I struck the, the, the firstborn of Egypt, I also was consecrating the firstborn of Israel. But then he says right after that in Numbers 3 and in Numbers 8, he says, I was at the same time, I was consecrating the firstborn of Israel, but now he says, I'm actually taking the Levites in their place. All right? And you say, what is this all about? I'm about to tell you. Okay. This was the institution of what's called the Levitical priesthood. Now, the first high priest of the Levitical order was Aaron, and then his son Eleazar, and on and on and on, from the household of Aaron, right, the brother of Moses. And the Levites 
where the priesthood who had access, there was the three divisions of Levites, the, the Kohathites and the, the sons of Merari. And the, there's really no need to get into all of this very technical. I just want you to hear this, okay? That the Levites were taken in place of the firstborn. And God inexplicably said, I'm taking Levites instead of the firstborn. The firstborn are consecrated, but I'm going to do a swap. And so we're going to substitute, put in Levites instead of the firstborn. Why? Because God was beginning the Levitical priesthood, which is a lesser order. Jesus came as a great high priest, not of the Levitical order, because he's not a Levite. He's of the tribe of Judah. Hebrews explains this. In the Levitical order, Jesus was not meant to be priest. He was born under the law, under the law. Under the Levitical system, brothers and sisters, and we'll get into this next week, under the Levitical system, Yeshua was not meant to be the Kohen, the, the priest. He was meant to be, he had a different role in the Levitical order. You want to hear? In the Levitical order, Yeshua was meant to be the lamb. Wow. Wow. That was the reason for the lesser order for him to be born under it. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son born under the law. Now he's the great high priest of a higher eternal order that's called in Hebrews the order of Melchizedek. But suddenly God institutes a lesser order, a human priesthood. Who's, it's limited to their lifetime. The, the, the Levitical priest, he comes in, he has to come in perfect before the presence of God, and then when he dies, the priesthood passes to his son. But we have a great high priest who has, who's of an eternal order. So you'd say, why would God institute the Levitical order? That was for Jesus to come, not to be priest, but to be lamb, to be the lamb slain, the fulfillment of the Passover. That's why the Levitical system was put in place. And then he fulfilled it. And then what happened? Okay? Once he fulfilled it, then when he went to the cross, when he as firstborn died on that Passover night. He gets to the cross, it's Passover, and there's the death of the firstborn, Yeshua, as if he were of Egypt, as if he were a sinner, and he dies, thus conferring upon us the blessing of firstborn. And then, when that Levitical order was fulfilled, you know what I believe God did? I believe God resubstituted, put back in instead of Levites. He put the firstborn back into the priesthood. So in the book of Numbers, he says, I've consecrated the firstborn, but I'm taking them out, and I'm putting in Levites. Why are you doing that? God doesn't explain. But then here comes the Messiah, born under the law. He's a lamb. He gets slain. He fulfills the law. And as he dies, he makes us all firstborn. And then when he makes us all firstborn, he now replaces the Levites. Now, please understand, this is not replacement theology. There is a, a, a twisted doctrine called replacement theology where Israel doesn't matter anymore. And Paul debunked that in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Israel does matter. Yes. Don't fool yourself. We're grafted in as a branch. But the Levitical order has been fulfilled. And so here, this is very deep. But I believe at the cross, Jesus becomes the firstborn slain so that we become what Hebrews 12, 23 calls the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, the spirits of just men made perfect. And what happened? God then took the Levitical order out of the way and replaced it. Because it says that the Levitical order, they would always have a man. Jeremiah says the Levites will always have a man to be the priest. And Ezekiel confirms it. She says, if there's always a man, then how does this work? Because there was the resubstituting, take out the Levites now and put back in the firstborn. But this time, it's not the firstborn just of flesh and blood. God has raised up children unto Abraham from all of us. And we are now all in that firstborn blessing. And he took out the Levites and he put in us, the firstborn. And we now are a royal priesthood to our God. That is part of your firstborn blessing. As royalty, you can make authoritative decrees with the word. As priest, you can apply the blood wherever it's needed in your life. The priest has the right to apply the blood. Kings did not, but the priest can. And Revelation tells us, I think it's Revelation 12, 11, it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. As king, you can use the blood. As priest, you can use the, the, the excuse me, as king, you can use the word. I misspoke. As king, you can use the word. As priest, you can use the blood. There is no enemy that you cannot overcome. There is no enemy that you cannot overcome. 
You can apply the blood. On the night of the Passover, brothers and sisters, God did not come down in human form to go to each house and apply the blood for them. They applied the blood to their own house. Now God supplied the lamb, but they applied the blood. And I want to leave you with that thought. And next week, we're going to see how the ruler of this world has been judged. Pharaoh has been dealt with. And I'll give you a sneak peek into where we'll pick up next week. Go to Colossians 2. Look at verse 14 through 16. I have left out the vast majority of my message for today because guess what? We've got six weeks. (laughs) And I'm going to take advantage of every last second. Is this blessing, you guys? So we can apply the blood. The priest has the right to apply the blood. What do I mean by that? You can apply the blood in your own house, in your own life. In Jesus' name, I charge you, apply the blood. Put it over the doorpost and stop looking around about, did I leave doors open? God will teach you how to shut your doors. Your job is to apply the blood. And I want you to see the enemy has been defeated. Pharaoh was judged. God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, God said, he told Abraham in advance, there's going to be a period of time for those 400 years where your descendants know surely that they will uh, serve a nation that is not their own. And he said, but then the, that nation I will judge and I'm going to bring your descendants out with great possessions. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. And so Pharaoh was judged. Jesus talked about the ruler of this world that we're not going to go to these references today with John chapter 12 John chapter 14 John chapter 16 Jesus said the ruler of this world is coming he has nothing in me Jesus said the ruler of this world has been judged okay I want you to know your enemy was defeated at the cross and we're going to see Pharaoh in that place of judgment Pharaoh has been dealt with okay the the the, the ruler of this world You, you need to know that your enemy was defeated at the cross And I'm going to unpack it more next week, okay? We're going to deal with this more next week, all right? So just hang in there because there's a lot I have not covered. We got six weeks. So Pharaoh has been defeated. The ruler of this world has been judged. I want you to see your enemy defeated as we walk out today. I want you to see it. I want you to look and behold. I don't want you just to hear about I want you to see that when we all come together one day and we see, and the Bible even prophesies, it foretells, is that the one? that caused all this tumultuous suffering and, and, and all of this mess in the world? Is this the one? This is what you need to see and quit being intimidated by this stupid, powerless, defeated enemy. It's Colossians chapter 2. Now, actually, we can look at, I, I said 14, but let's go to 13. Thank you so, so much to both Stephanies back there. We got, a, we got a, two Stephanies back there that are just crushing it today. <laughs> um, more, more people that don't want to be embarrassed that I'm determined to embarrass. Uh, Colossians 2 in verse 13, it says, And you, being dead in your trespasses, and I have to say this, You being dead in your trespasses, do you want to know how much of your redemption had to do with you? None. This is why on the Passover, when God instituted the Passover, one of the things God told Moses that should be part of the the Passover is this. He said, no customary work shall be done. It's a night of solemn assembly, and he said, you won't do any work. No work. No customary work shall be done. Now, this is coming from people that their whole life has consisted of working. Think about it. 430 years. These people were born into slavery. Their whole life consisted of working. And one of the things that Pharaoh did that we'll look at next week, if we have time, is that Pharaoh took away their supply of the straw and made them go gather their own stubble. He made them go gather their own stubble. There's a picture there. The enemy will cause you to spend your whole lifetime just gathering worthless stubble. Did you know that when you stand before God one day, 1 Corinthians 3 tells us that 
our works will be judged of what sort they are, whether they're gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And anything that's done in the flesh is wood, hay, and stubble. It'll burn up. The enemy will send you on a wild goose chase, spending your whole life just gathering stubble. And that's what Pharaoh sent the people of Israel out to do. Go, go get your stubble. Go, go get stubble. And, and, and they spent their whole life for a, for a long time on this wild goose chase. That's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to make you go on this wild goose chase collecting stubble that has no eternal value and wearing yourself out. And then Pharaoh was mad at Moses. He said, you're making the people rest. He was an enemy of rest, whereas God is a God of rest. And so when the Passover was instituted, Moses said, on this night throughout all your generations, there will be no customary work done. Why was there no work done? Because God wanted them to know without any doubt that their redemption and their deliverance had absolutely nothing to do with their efforts. Whatsoever. You're not going to work on this night because you're going to watch me work. Don't think that your redemption has anything to do with your efforts. Therefore, you're forbidden from doing any customary work on this night. Why? Lest you think you had something to do with it. Why? We couldn't do anything about it. We were dead in our trespasses. You being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. Happy Resurrection Day, brothers and sisters. This is our day of when we were made alive together with him. You were dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh. He's made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Verse 15, uh, 14, rather, goes on to say, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. You'll notice I'm reading from the New King James. Not every English translation renders it in this manner, but it says wiped out the handwriting. The reason it's used, it says handwriting in this rendering, it's very accurate to the original Greek, the original language, because the Greek word there is kairographon, and it literally means that which was written by the hand. Why? Because they didn't nail the tablets of the law to the cross. They knelt the very hand that had written and engraved the law. So he's nailed to the cross, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Verse 15 then goes on to say, having disarmed, before, before Jesus defeated your enemy, he disarmed your enemy. This is a big deal, brothers and sisters. Please listen. I want you to understand why. He could have just defeated your enemy and left it at that. But before defeating the enemy, he had to disarm the enemy. Here's why. Because the enemy, when you were in your trespasses, the enemy was armed with accusations on the basis of a broken law. And he is called the accuser of the brethren. So he was armed. Now those weapons formed against you, particularly it says every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Why? Because that law was then fulfilled and the payment that was made is far greater, it far outweighs the debt that was owed. And so when Jesus fulfilled the law before defeating the enemy, he disarmed the enemy because now the enemy has no, his, his weapon against you is accusation. Well, when the law was fulfilled, the enemy was disarmed. Because he cannot hold, there's no accusation that can stand against you anymore. Don't agree with any accusation leveled against you because the law's been fulfilled completely. It's all been paid. And so the enemy has been utterly disarmed because the law was nailed to the cross, the handwriting, it was taken out of the way. And then it says he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in it. The ruler of this world is judged Pharaoh has been dealt with, and you'll see next week just how far God went to make it happen. I love you. Happy Resurrection Sunday, and we're going to enjoy this journey together. I've been dreaming of teaching this series ever since last year during Passover. I knew the series was coming, and we're going to enjoy this together as we go through the Passover all the way from the Exodus to the cross. I love you and I'll see you next Sunday. Hallelujah. Well, I would suggest that you not miss any of these. Wow. In fact, I don't know. We now, may I'm make it. I'm confused. How many weeks are we talking about he's going to be doing this? <laughs>
Six, is that right? That was, <laughs> did you not enjoy that? That yeah. was amazing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. This was so good. All right. If you're here today, Easter Sunday, and you have never, you came along with somebody, you're a family member, you were trying to be polite, and you came along, but you don't really believe, today is your day. You need Jesus in your life. You need to be born again. If you've never been born again, and you know you haven't ever been born again, then today is your day. Like I said, we're going to have a prayer. In fact, I'm going to pray in just a minute. You join in on that prayer. And afterwards, you can come down and tell us. In fact, raise your hand. Be bold enough to raise your hand if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're not born again. No shame in it. We've all been there. But raise your hand if that's you. Okay, I don't see any hands right now in the sanctuary. But afterwards, if that's you and you didn't want to raise your hand, just, you know, come up to one of our prayer ministers after church, and they'll be glad to lead you in a prayer of, of salvation. We're going to also give you an opportunity on live stream to do the same thing. And we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer. And uh, Regina's going to repeat after me. But that prayer, you need to believe it in your heart. When you're praying this prayer, if you want to receive Jesus now, you want to pass from death into life, then you need to believe this in your heart and confess it with your mouth, both things, and then you will be saved. That's what the Word guarantees and promises us that. So if you're on live stream or you're in this sanctuary and you have not done this, let's just repeat after me and believe it in your heart. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he was born as a baby. I believe that he was born as a baby. On this earth. On this earth. That you sent him. That you sent him. And he had a, a, he had a life. He had a life. He had a death. He had a death. But he had a resurrection. But he had a resurrection. That he went to the cross. He went to the cross. And he took care of my sins. He took care of my sins. He paid the price for my sins. He paid the price for my sins. Past. Past. Present. Present. And future. And future. That I would no longer have to have a sin nature. That I would no longer have a sin nature. That I could redeem my sin nature or turn in my sin nature for the righteousness of God. That I could turn in my sin nature for the righteousness of God. I choose right now. I choose right now. To confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. To confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I choose right now. I choose right now. To give up my old sin nature. To give up my old sin nature. And to take on the nature of God. And to take on the nature of God. Which is the nature of righteousness. Which is the nature of righteousness. I choose I choose right now to become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I choose right now to become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So, Father, I, want, I am born again. So, Father, I am born again. According to your word. According to your word. Because I received Jesus. Because I received Jesus. And as my Lord. As my Lord. As my Savior. As my Savior. And that makes me righteous. And that makes me righteous. In Jesus' in name. In Jesus' name. Well, you are now born again. Amen. You believe that Hallelujah. in your heart and you confessed it with your mouth. Welcome to the body of Christ. Welcome to the family of Christ. Hallelujah. Also, I want to say one other thing, too. <clears throat> if you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. If you want the power, that's where the power is. Your, your salvation is not contingent on being baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. But you walking in, the power of God is contingent on receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. If you're here in this sanctuary and you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, raise your hand right now. Be bold enough. If you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, I'm telling you, that's the disciples. That's when the, Jesus said, don't go do anything. Go to the upper room. Acts chapter 2 and tarry just wait there till you receive the power to go do what I've called you to do we don't have to go tarry anymore we just have to receive it just like we did salvation so if that's you raise your hand right now don't be a secret agent Christian raise your hand right now and just let us see you and we'll let you give you an opportunity to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit right now hallelujah 
All right, don't see anybody right now. Online, live stream. If you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, give us a call, 404-697-5215, and we'll be glad to tell you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and lead you in the prayer to receive it. Amen. Also, if you receive salvation and you're online, also call that same number, and we would love to talk to you and share the testimony. Hallelujah. Y'all, wasn't that awesome today? Hallelujah. All right, we want our... We want our prayer ministers to come on down, if you would. And while we're doing that, while they're coming down, we want to go ahead and say bye to live stream. Thank you, live stream, everyone watching on live stream. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you.